Hi, I'm David Colosso. I'm a graduate student here at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Now, in collaboration with the Hillman Library and the Center for Philosophy of Science, we'll be looking at some of the interesting artifacts in the Archives of Scientific Philosophy. Let's go to the archives. Today I'll be meeting with History and Philosophy of Science graduate student Siska de Berdemaker, and we'll be talking about the Harmonia Macrocosmica and different models of the solar system. Hey, so Siska, thank you for joining us. Sure. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work and uh, how it relates to this cool book? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a graduate student here at the University of Pittsburgh in History and Philosophy of Science, uh, and my own work focuses mostly on uh, relativistic cosmology, so 20th century onwards. But uh, as part of my graduate training here, I taught a course on the history of astronomy and cosmology. And um, together with Lance and Ben, who work here at the archives, I set up a visit for my students to the Hillman Library archives to give them a little bit of a flavor of what archival research could look like, what kind of documents you could encounter, and how much fun it can be. Uh, and one of the documents they got to look at was this Harmonia Macrocosmica um, from 1708. And um, part of the reason why I wanted them to look at this volume is because A, it's super pretty and cool, but also because uh, it actually contains depictions of three of the major systems uh, or models of the solar system um, that have been proposed throughout the history of cosmology. So we have the Ptolemaic, the Copernican, and the uh, Tychonian system that have been proposed in here, or that have been modeled in here. Wait, so this is 1708. How did, how did the Archives of Scientific Philosophy you know, come to get this book? Uh, that's actually a good question and one that we don't have a super sure answer to. Um, so we know the book's from 1708 and only two other copies of this volume have been found or have been, have been located elsewhere. Um, but how did the uh, archives get it? Well, uh, we're not quite sure. The first records of it in the university system are from the late 19th century. Um, but we have some idea about how we came to the library before that. Um, there was a group of wealthy Pittsburghers, uh, bankers, businessmen, who founded the Allegheny Telescope Association. Um, and they did that because they wanted to construct an observatory, and so they did. They constructed the Allegheny Observatory here in Pittsburgh. Um, and as part of the observatory, they also created this huge library with a bunch of very interesting volumes. And it's quite plausible that this was part of that original library. And then when the observatory was donated to the University of Pittsburgh, the library was donated with it, and thus uh, the library acquired this volume, basically. Okay, so you say we, we have uh, three models. We have the Ptolemaic yeah. model, we have the Copernican model, and we have the Tychonian model. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the difference between them? Let's, let's take a look. Yeah, sure. Let's look at, this, uh, at the models as they're shown here. So let's start with the Ptolemaic model. So the Ptolemaic model was proposed by Claudius Ptolemy in about the second century. He lived in um, Alexandria, uh, Egypt. We don't know much about Ptolemy, but um, the model that he proposed in his book, The Almagest, was actually hugely influential. And as you can see here, it's a geocentric model. So we have the Earth in the center here, and then we have the planets. So we have the moon, we have various planets. We also have the sun. They're all revolving around uh, uh, the Earth. So that's why it's called a geocentric system. And then at the outskirts of the model, we have what is called the sphere of the fixed star. So all of the stars were on one sphere at the outskirts of our solar system in this model. So that's a Ptolemaic model. Um, a different model was proposed by Copernicus. Uh, and Copernicus proposed what is called a heliocentric model in 1543. Heliocentric means that the sun is at the center. So rather than the Earth being in the center, we have the sun at the center and then all of the planets revolving around the sun, except for the moon, of course, um, that one's revolving around the Earth. Um, but just like, uh, like Ptolemy, Copernicus actually proposes that there's still a sphere of fixed stars at the outskirts. So even though we think that this model is right now the most right, um, there's actually been a lot that has changed about this model since 1543, which is not that surprising. Not surprising. Yeah. Um, and then the last model, which I mentioned, was the Tychonic or the Tychonian model. Um, and this model is uh, proposed by Tycho Brahe in 1588. Um, and it's a weird hybrid between the two, between a heliocentric and a geocentric model. Because if you look closely, you see here in the center is a tiny Earth. So it's still geocentric in the sense that the Earth is standing in the middle. Um, and then we have the moon and the sun revolving around the Earth. But all of the other planets are revolving around uh, the sun. So that's what I mean by it's a weird hybrid between the two. You actually still uh, have the Earth in the center, but then the planets, all of the other planets revolving around uh, the sun. 
So this is great. Um, and look at all this interesting imagery. I mean, what's going on here? What, what is all this? Uh, who are these figures? Yeah, there's lots of interesting imagery going on here. And in fact, all of these figures um, uh, are quite interesting to look at themselves. Because, for example, so we're looking here at the Tychonic system. But if you look closely here, this man right here with the mustache, that's Tycho Brahe. You can recognize him easily because of the mustache and the fact that he had a prosthetic silver nose. Um, yeah, so he's, uh, he's right there. Um, but there's lots of other things that we can get out of this as well. So, for example, um, if we uh, look uh, a little bit back to the Ptolemaic system, um, we can notice something quite interesting as well. Let's get back a little bit. So here, for example, you see all of these interesting symbols depicted, right? These weren't just fun figures to be drawn on the figure. Actually, these were alchemical symbols that were associated with the different planets. So they're also depicted here and, and teaching us that alchemy was actually also quite central at the time. It's great. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we ha now we have these systems. I mean, you know, what can we what can we do with them? Uh, you know, what is there to be uh, you know done with observation or maybe prediction? Mm. There's quite a lot actually, and and you know, even though from the way they're they're drawn here, you might think that they're just like you know pretty pictures to look at, but in fact, there's quite a lot that we can learn from them. And so, let me just go back to the uh, Copernican one really quickly, um, just for a brief second because there's something interesting I want to show you there. Um, so if you go here to the Copernican, by the way, this is Copernicus, um, but if we go to the Copernican system, here, for example, you see that there's four little things drawn around Jupiter. This is the planet of Jupiter. Those are the four moons of Jupiter that Galileo discovered. Um, so that's already an important observation that is being recorded here. Um, but there's other things as well. So remember that I told you about Tycho's system, right? The, the hybrid between the two? Right, yeah, so heliocentric and geocentric. Yeah, this hybrid. So I told you earlier, this was proposed in 1588, but Copernicus was already, already proposed this system in 1543. So why did Tycho propose his one if we now consider Copernicus to be the most right? Well, Tycho actually had lots of observational reasons for that. Tycho had a huge observatory in Denmark. And uh, one of the observations he made was that the fixed stars had visible diameters. Now, if you compare, if you combine that observation with the Copernican system, it actually turns out that the fixed stars might be three times as large as the sun. And given that the sun gives us all of the light on the earth, Tycho thought that that was something that was just not possible at all. So that was one observation and, and that he used in an argument to reject the Copernican system. You know, so he was responding with observations. But even in the Ptolemaic system, there are lots of crucial observations that played a role. So here we see a depiction of uh, eccentric motion and of epicycles. And epicycles is something that you often hear associated with uh, the Ptolemaic system. I won't explain the details here, but what I do want to mention is that these epicycles were introduced by Ptolemy um, to really track the motions of the planets in a lot of detail. So if he just introduced the circular motions, it turns out that his model wasn't quite accurate with the observations. Okay. By introducing epicycles, he actually managed to track the observations or to like make his model predict the observations very, very accurately. Um, so that's the epicycles here. And then finally, if we flip through the last page of this volume, right here, you see something quite interesting. So we see here a map of Europe, right? And if you look close, you see that there's this dark band running across um, the map. Now, if you, what, is this, what is this band tracking? Well, it's actually a recording of the path of a solar eclipse across Europe. So it's this record of a very detailed observation of how a solar eclipse moved across Europe. It is, that is also recorded here. So this is, this is really great. So you see these three models that are, in a sense, incompatible, yeah. theoretically. But they can all work with this kind of observational data. And it seems like, in some cases at least, make good predictions. Yeah, definitely. That's great. Yeah, that's great you get this out of this book. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for showing this to us today.